Now in our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are, this week, in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1146 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL has told the FCC that additional volunteer examiner coordinators are not required. We will have team coverage. The International Amateur Radio Union regions are all in agreement on preliminary World Radio Communications Conference 2023 positions. The ARRL has extended Field Day 2020 COVID pandemic operating rule waivers for 2021 and adds a Class D and Class E power limitation. We will have all the details. A California amateur wins the 2020 Congressional App Challenge, and his app will automate your net check-ins. We will have the details. The Orlando Hamcation Special Edition online event and QSO party is happening right now, this weekend. The lack of congressional funding is hampering the FCC's ability to enforce the Pirate Radio Act on illegal broadcasters. Austrian amateurs realize there is a proposed threat in a new amendment to that country's telecommunications law. Radio amateurs in Mississippi gain coverage on a local television news broadcast by setting up for the Mississippi QSO party in the station's parking lot. We will have the story. And the U.S. Army Research Laboratory has developed a new quantum receiver for field use that can detect signals from DC to 20 gigahertz. Wouldn't you like to have that in your shack? We will tell you all about it in this week's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new and happening with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about how the state of Nevada wants to set up what it calls innovation zones to attract high-tech companies into large tracts of land and also let them set up their own governments within the zones. Leo will also look at the new zero-day vulnerabilities attacking the Chrome operating system. He will tell us how the Chinese cell manufacturer Huawei has set up a lot of bogus Twitter accounts, and he will answer the question, what is a millennial? And we'll also look at the upcoming Apple car. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, what is a prediction during his segment, Foundations of Amateur Radio? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will look back in history and find Ham's upset with the ARRL over its new proposal called Incentive Licensing. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will have his final segment on producing a successful public service announcement to promote your upcoming club activities on local broadcast radio. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in chilly and snowy Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from along the southern edge of Lake Ontario in snowy and cold Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from Ice Station Zebra, again atop the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where we're bracing once again this weekend for a uh, veritable big load of snow. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the snowshoes have been replaced by cross-country skis, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where it's sunny and warm, at least this week, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where weather-wise, forget about three dog nights. Here we're having three cat nights. Just ask my XYL. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Dave? Leading off our news this week, 
The pandemic modified ARRL field day rules from 2020 will continue this June with the addition of a power limit imposed on Class D home stations and Class E home stations running emergency power. With more details to refresh your memory of the pandemic modified field day rules for 2021, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. The news from the ARRL Board's Programs and Services Committee comes as many clubs and groups are starting preparations for Field Day in earnest. Field Day 2021 will take place June 26 and 27. For Field Day 2021, Class D stations may work all other Field Day stations, including other Class D stations for points. This year, however, Class D and Class E stations will be limited to 150 watts PEP output. For Field Day 2021, an aggregate club score will be published just as it was done last year. The aggregate score will be a sum of all individual entries that attributed their scores to that of a specific club. ARRL Field Day is one of the biggest events on the amateur radio calendar. Last summer, a record 10,213 entries were received. The ARRL Field Day webpage, www.arrl.org forward slash field hyphen day, contains complete rules and entry forms as well as any updated information as it becomes available. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. This early decision should alleviate any hesitancy that radio clubs and individual field day participants may have with their planning for this event, said ARRL Contest Program Manager Paul Bork, N1SFE. With the greater flexibility afforded by the rules waivers, individuals and groups will still be able to participate in field day while still staying within any public health recommendations and or requirements, Bork said. The preferred method of submitting entries after field day is via the web applet. The ARRL field day rules include instructions on how to submit entries, which must be submitted or postmarked by Tuesday, July 27, 2021. Once again, ARRL field day webpage contains the complete rules and entry forms, as well as any updated information as it becomes available. Join the ARRL Field Day Facebook page. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. The ARRL has told the FCC that no additional volunteer examiner coordinators are needed to oversee the administration of amateur radio exams by volunteer examiners. With more details on the League's response to the FCC, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who is standing by at League headquarters with this report. Examination opportunities have continued to be widely available throughout the U.S., except for a couple of months during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and adding VECs to the 14 now in place would, ARRL said, have no effect on the number of available exams. ARRL's comments on February 4th were in response to a January 5th FCC public notice seeking input on possible expansion of the VEC pool. ARRL said it found that even though 10 of the 12 months for calendar year 2020 were times of severe disruption throughout the nation, amateur examination opportunities and numbers were strong. Instead of increasing the number of VECs, ARRL encouraged volunteers to become accredited as volunteer examiners and to volunteer to help the current VECs wherever possible. ARRL noted that VEs, not VECs, are responsible for administering amateur radio exams. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME.
In response to the Commission's notice in WT Docket 21-2, the ARRL reviewed the amateur examination numbers for the past five years, including the pandemic period, ARRL said in its comments. Multiple web-based exam opportunities are available across the U.S., even on short notice, and in-person examinations are available in many areas where local regulation and special safety requirements allow. It has never been easier, ARRL asserted, noting that exam sessions often are available within two days, but rarely more than seven if taking advantage of a remote web-based exam opportunity. ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator, the nation's largest, has 30,000 accredited VEs with 11,000 of them regularly participating in exam activities on a weekly or monthly basis. The number of new and upgraded licenses has been in line with earlier years with noticeable increases in the four months following the lockdown that occurred in many areas in the early spring, ARRL pointed out. New FCC licenses issued in January 2021, number 2,838, compared with 2,058 for a year earlier. Upgrades were also up significantly, 920 in January 2021 to 554 for the same month last year. The 14 separate and independent FCC-approved VECs readily accredit additional VEs whenever and wherever needed, ARRL concluded. Increasing the number of individual VECs would have no discernible benefit. Instead, ARRL said, increasing the number of VECs would expand the complexity of VEC coordination and management, increase demand on FCC resources to interface with additional organizations, and raise the potential for abuse and fraud. The International Amateur Radio Union has agreed on its preliminary positions for the World Radio Communication Conference 2023. According to Barry Lewis, g 4 saj a chair of the IARU Region 1 Spectrum Affairs. The preparatory work for WRC 23 has started across all three regions in both the International Telecommunications Union Radio Communications Sector and the Regional Telecommunications Organizations. The IARU has representatives in these regional telecommunications orgs and the international telecommunications sectors contributing to the studies and helping to develop the regional positions on all the WRC agenda items. It's vital that the amateur community presents its views in a consolidated and consistent manner in each radio communication conference. Lewis said the IARU Administrative Council has agreed on initial preliminary positions covering the six most important agenda items for the amateur and amateur satellite service. Here are the preliminary IARU positions. Agenda 1.2 opposed the identification of 10.0 to 10.5 gigahertz for international mobile telecommunications in Region 2, the Americas, as well as the introductions of a mobile service allocation in that region. Agenda item 1.12 supports studies that include the need to protect the incumbent amateur service in the adjacent 50 to 54 megahertz band. The agenda item calls for studies to establish a possible new secondary allocation for spaceborne radar sounders within a range of frequencies around 45 megahertz. Agenda item 1.14 supports retaining the 248 to 250 gigahertz primary and the 241 to 248 gigahertz secondary amateur and amateur satellite services. Agenda item 1.18 supports retention of the amateur secondary allocation of 3300 to 3400 megahertz in regions 2 and 3. Agenda item 9.1, Topic A, the IARU said, in considering potential new regulatory provisions for the recognition of space weather systems, additional constraints on incumbent services, including the amateur and amateur satellite services, must be avoided. And finally, Agenda item 9.1, Topic B, the IARU said that radio amateurs have successfully coexisted and innovated in the frequency range of 1240 to 1300 megahertz for many years and the IARU believes the regulatory status of the amateur and amateur satellite services in this range is already clear. Amateur radio on the International Space Station, known as ARIS, and its partners are troubleshooting what might be keeping the November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra amateur radio station off the air. 
an attempted contact with a school in Wyoming between Oscar November 4 India Sierra Sierra on Earth and astronaut Mike Hopkins, Kilo Foxtrot 5 Lima Juliet Golf on the space station using NA-1SS had to abort when no downlinking signal was heard. Having then realised there was a problem, Aris has determined that the fault is not with the radio equipment on board the ISS Columbus module. Aris International Chair Frank Bauer, Kilo Alpha 3 Hotel Delta Oscar, explained that during a 27th of January spacewalk to install exterior cabling on the ISS module, the coaxial feed line installed 11 years ago was replaced with another one built by the European Space Agency and Airbus. It includes two additional RF connectors to support the Bartolomeo payload hosting platform installed last spring on Columbus. Bauer said that on the 26th of January, prior to a spacewalk outside the ISS, the Columbus Next Generation radio system was shut down and the internal coaxial cable to the antenna was disconnected from the ARIS radio as a safety precaution. During the spacewalk, an external four-connector coax feed line replaced the one with only two connectors. This change was made to allow the European Space Agency to connect some additional customers to the Bartolomeo platform. With the spacewalk completed, the crew restarted the ISS amateur radio station on the 28th of January, but no voice repeater or APRS downlink reports were heard, and no downlink signal was received during a scheduled schools contact. Bauer said that because the external cable is not an ARIS cable, they were working with the European Space Agency and NASA on a way forward. NASA has opened a payload anomaly report on this issue, and we hope to bring you an update on this situation in a future bulletin. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. ARRL member Sean Dolan, KM6NGN of Concord, California, is the winner of the 2020 Congressional App Challenge for California's 11th District, according to an announcement from U.S. Representative Mark Desaunier. The app, NetHam, was the top winner in the 2020 Congressional App Challenge. The United States House of Representatives established the nationwide award eight years ago to inspire students in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. The award is being given out this year in 308 of 435 congressional districts. Donnellan, a ninth grader at Northgate High School, designed and created NetHam, the public service event coordinator's third hand. My app is a radio that partially automates the more arduous and monotonous tasks of being the main operator of an amateur radio voice net. These tasks include automated sign-in of operators, easy tracking of participants without lengthy radio conversations, and an operator attention keeper attention caller, Donnellan told ARRL. The point of these features is to allow a radio net control station to focus on the more important task of relaying pertinent information around a radio network, rather than focusing on constantly reciting and editing operator and event participation rosters. The Orlando Hamcation Special Edition Online Event and QSO Party will take place this weekend, February 13th and 14th. The online event will include youth, technology, contesting, and vendor webinar tracks via Zoom. The ARRL will also prevent two webinars on Saturday, February 13th. The ARR member forum at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time will be moderated by ARRL Southeast Division Director Mickey Baker and 4MB. Presenters include ARRL CEO Dave Minster, NA2AA, and ARRL Director of Emergency Management Paul Gilbert, KE5ZW. Gilbert will also moderate an amateur radio emergency service presentation at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The ARIES presentation will include ARRL Northern Florida Section Emergency Coordinator Carl Martin, K4HBN, and Southern Florida SEC John Wells, W4CMH. The Hamcation QSO Party, a 12-hour on-air event, will also take place this weekend. Nine Hamcation special event stations with one-by-one -one calls will be on the air with combined suffix spelling out Hamcation. Each contact will count as one point, and stations may be worked once on each band and mode. Scores will be posted on www.3830scores.com. No logs are required, and plaques and certificates will be awarded. 
The head of enforcement for the Federal Communications Commission says efforts to implement the new Pirate Act against illegal radio stations have been hampered by the pandemic, as well as a lack of funding from Congress. Rosemary C. Harold, the chief of the FCC Enforcement Bureau, submitted the Commission's first annual report to Congress about its pirate radio work as required in the Act that became law a year ago. That law raised the amount of fines the FCC can issue up to $100,000 per day and $2 million total, and it expanded the definition of who can be fined to include people who willfully and knowingly help pirate radio operations. The Commission did report some enforcement activity for the year as listed below, but Herald identified two issues that have limited its work. First, the FCC in March implemented a mandatory telework policy. That complicated the work of pirate enforcement, which requires agents to engage in significant in-person activities to gather evidence, including witness statements and technical measurements of a pirate station's operations. Second, the Commission has received no funding to implement the Pirate Act, she wrote. The Congressional Budget Office and the Commission both estimated that it would cost $11 million for the Commission to implement the Act, she said. And yet, the Pirate Act itself contained no appropriation or other funding source to cover its implementation costs. And because the Commission's fiscal year 2021 budget ceiling level was established by the Office of Management and Budget on December 3, 2019, before Congress adopted the Pirate Act, the Commission did not have an opportunity to incorporate costs related to the implementation of the Pirate Act during the President's fiscal year 2021 budget process. The FCC also is supposed to conduct sweeps at least once a year in five markets that have the most pirate radio activity. It began studying this, but the lack of funding and the pandemic-related restrictions prevented any sweeps. Harold said the Bureau's ability to fully conduct the sweeps will remain subject to obtaining new funding through the appropriations process, as well as the end of the pandemic and the FCC was supposed to develop a public database by April 2020 that listed all licensed AM and FM stations, as well as all entities that have received a notice of unlicensed operation, notice of apparent liability, or forfeiture order. But that, too, didn't happen because of lack of appropriated funds. Nevertheless, the Enforcement Bureau was not idle in 2020. Herald cited new efforts to inform property owners and property managers of apparent pirate broadcasts from their properties and to describe the potential consequences to the property owner or manager. The first notices were issued in New York last month, as we've reported. Although these ongoing proceedings are in their early stages, initial discussions with the property owners have been promising, Herald told Congress. The FCC is also doing more general outreach to educate commercial and residential property owners and managers. The law also encourages the Commission to skip the usual step of issuing a notice of unauthorized operation and proceed instead directly to a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture. The Enforcement Bureau implemented that in December. And on the enforcement side, Harold listed several actions, including the settlement of two long-running investigations. Acerome Jean Charles and Gerlins Caesar separately agreed to monetary settlements, including significant suspended penalties that would be triggered if they resumed operations. The International Amateur Radio Union are clearly worried about misunderstandings about transmitting close to the edge of the amateur bands. When transmitting, it's important that radio amateurs keep their transmissions completely within the frequency bands allocated to them. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 has recently provided some guidance concerning the 5 MHz or 60 m band, which has now been permitted in many countries. Time and again, the question arises as to how close to the band edge you can legally go when transmitting in single sideband voice mode.
Resulting from allocations permitted after the World Radio Conference 2015, the frequency range from 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz, also known as the 60 meter band, is allocated to the amateur radio service on a secondary basis. This is the case for most of Europe, although it should be mentioned that the UK currently enjoys a wider 60 meter allocation. But let's use the European band edge of 5366.5 kHz for an example. So is it okay to transmit up a sideband as close as 5366.0 kHz? On an amateur radio transmitter, the so-called dial frequency indicates only the frequency of the carrier suppressed in single sideband. However, the actual speech modulation range for USB extends up to 3 kHz higher, in other words, to 5369 kHz. This means that a large part of that signal would be way outside the range assigned to the amateur radio service. That part of the spectrum covers a section of 60 meters intended for narrow band weak signal modes, such as WSPR, and thus such a signal leads to interference. The band plan indicates in the notes that in the case of the 60 meter band in upper sideband, the highest dial frequency to be set is 5363 kHz, then the whole range of the modulation spectrum is below 5366 kHz, and thus both within the band and away from the weak signal narrow band mode section. As another example, the upper frequency limit of the 20 meter amateur radio band is 14350 kHz, and thus the highest dial frequency that should be set in upper sideband mode would be 14347 kHz, that is, 3 kHz below the upper band limit. Originating from Albany, New York, and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I'm your tech guy. That's what we talk about here. All the all the gizmos and gadgets in our lives that are never working. <laughs> Pretty soon you're going to have to reboot your microwave, your car, your refrigerator, and all that. Kind of have to sometimes. I had to reboot my Tesla when I had a Tesla every once in a while. There's a three-finger salute on the Tesla that you hold everything down. I mean, the car still works. You could do it while you're driving. But the screen it resets the screen and it goes black. And then, yeah, it's not a good feeling. <laughs> that's not a that's not a good feeling when you make a car that works like a computer there's some pros but there are a lot of cons like having to reboot it that's not necessarily so good nevada has announced a plan to launch innovation zones in nevada to jumpstart the state's economy by attracting technology firms and attracting, yeah, very attractive. This is from the Las Vegas Review Journal this week. The zones would let companies with large areas of land, and there's a lot of it in Nevada because it's mostly desert, form governments, form governments, <laughs> carrying the same authority as counties, including the ability to oppose taxes, form school districts, courts, Yes, uh, the Google Court has, I have jury duty with the Google Court, and provide government services. It hasn't been uh, introduced to the legislature, so my, the governor pitched it, Sisliak, in uh, Sisalak. Steve pitched it at his State of the State address. It would bring new business to the forefront of groundbreaking technologies without the use of tax abatements or other publicly in front of incentive packages. That's how they get companies like Tesla to build factories in Nevada, like the Giga Factory, the Battery Factory. You give them tax breaks. That's the traditional way. Now you give them a court and the ability to tax. You're, it's the county. I'm in Tesla County. Yep. The Sheriff Elon. Sheriff Elon is, uh, Wow. Now, this is a, here's a good one. A company called Blockchains LLC. See, right there, that's a, <laughs> that's a scary name. Blockchains LLC uh, is one of the com companies that wants to, to move in. They want to build a smart city in an area east of Reno. I'd like to live in a smart city, but I'm a little nervous about the, the traditional local government model is that inadequate alone says Governor Sisolak, to provide the resources to make Nevada a leader in attracting and retaining businesses. So, you know, Larry Page, the founder of Google, 
gave a very weird and odd speech at one of the big Google conferences some years back in which he said, I wish we had an island. If we only had Google Island where the regulators weren't slowing us down and making it hard for us to do the right thing. Would you want to live in Facebook land? <laughs> uh, I guess in a way that's kind of what, you know, Disney has some talent, but I don't think they have courts and the right to tax. That's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Update your uh, Chrome zero day vulnerability. Bad, bad thing uh, being exploited in the wild. Google found out about this about, well, let's see, January 24th. What was that? Seven plus third, almost two weeks ago. Uh, and they're now putting out a new version of Chrome. The nice thing about these browsers these days, they update automatically. You don't have to really think about it. But still, this is a good thing. It's a good thing. This is what you want. Uh, let's see what other tech news. <laughs> Huawei, which isn't the, you know, this is the company, the Chinese company that uh, the president kind of wanted to ban. I think they did ban. Uh, at least U.S. companies can't do deal with Huawei. Huawei's the number one phone manufacturer in the world. They sell a lot of phones in China. And the thing that the U.S. government is worried about, probably rightly so, was that they also were the biggest manufacturer of 5G equipment. And uh, everybody all over the world was putting in Huawei 5G equipment, which made, I think, people a little bit nervous. You know, I mean, Huawei's done some bad things. <laughs> the latest... Isn't that bad, but it's interesting. It's something that may maybe want make you want to think about what you see on. You use Twitter. Huawei created at least, at last count, 14 different Twitter accounts, fake accounts, pretending to be respected telecommunications experts, writers, academics. The goal, it was all aimed at Belgium, little old Belgium, which wanted to keep Huawei out of their 5G networks. The bogus pro Huawei accounts used computer generated profile pictures, so they looked real. And then they retweeted, they amplified stuff from real Huawei executives. You know, and I probably Twitter has some rule against it, but it doesn't mean they enforce it or they're able to even enforce it. U.S. companies have done this too. It's not unheard of. In fact, I, there's a lot of evidence. The FCC did it when they were trying to repeal net neutrality. They made up fake people on their comments saying, yeah, this is a great idea. I love this idea. <laughs> Even though it wasn't, wasn't real. Wow. So just, you know, I guess consider, I don't, who uses Twitter anymore? Really? No. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? Do you have a handle? If you, uh, you know, a lot of these handles come from your youth. <laughs> uh, you know, you got on AOL, uh, Instant Messenger, AIM, or, uh, you know, something like that. And you gave yourself a handle, double base 65 or something. And then it never changes. And so it's always a little bit of your youth. Just drag, you're dragging it along with you into old age. I just use my name, <laughs> Leo, because I'm an old guy. We didn't have handles when I was a kid. We, we barely had record players. It was very, it was the olden days. And uh, yeah, kerosene lanterns. We didn't have handles. But now if you grew up in the internet era, which means nowadays if you're under 40, I guess, millennials, somebody told me the way you can tell, uh, you can figure out what age a millennial is, is that Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, is the oldest millennial. So if you're, if you're Zuck's age or younger, you're a millennial, or I guess there's something beyond millennials now. Millennials, we typically, you, by the way, Zuck was born in 84. He's 36. So, and, and that's roughly, you know, what we call a millennial, somebody born in the 80s or 90s, children of the baby boomers and early Gen Xers, I, such silly stuff. And then there's millennials and then there were Zoomers, which is kind of more appropriate in this day and age. Anybody who grew up in, in the in COVID-19 era would be a Zoomer. No, it's not. It, Zoomers are 97 through 2012, according to Wikipedia, the major generations of the Western world. Uh, and then after uh, after 2010, or even, I guess, 2012, any anybody born in the last eight years is, according to Wikipedia, Generation Alpha. <sighs> anyway, Mick, who's in our chat room, his name is Mick, right? He said, Mick's my lifelong nickname. 
except for the 20 years in the Air Force. What are they calling you in the Air Force? Probably had one of them, you know, Top Gun names, I would imagine. Tokyo Tony, that, you know, that's like his real name plus where he used to live, Tokyo. That makes sense. Chumley, don't know what that is. Isn't that a cartoon character, the walrus Chumley? So they all have they all have different different names from their real name. And I guess that makes sense. I guess that makes sense. It's a way that you can take on a persona. You can be somebody else. I just, I never, I, I, I must, I just missed it because I'm a baby boomer. Let's see, there was the lost generation at the turn of the century. And then there was the silent generation. No, no. After the lost generation was the greatest generation, the World War II generation. Then the silent generation, a.k.a. the lucky few. I don't, I don't know why. Then baby boomers, a.k.a. the me generation. Remember that? They called us the me generation because all we cared about is ourselves. Then along came the millennials and we realized, yeah, maybe we weren't. <laughs> maybe we, we weren't the worst. Baby boomers, me generation, generation X. Millennials, Generation Y, Zoomers, Generation Z. That's a problem. If you're going to go X, Y, Z, then where do you go? Generation Alpha. It's all made up. Just like your uh, your uh, chat room handles. All made up. I need a good chat room handle. What should I be? I should have a chat room handle. Often it's uh, something, that, uh, a TV show you liked or a, a cartoon character you loved. Professor Laura, do you have a handle? Like, what did you use on AIM or whatever it was when you were, you were, you're too young for AIM, probably. Wasn't allowed on AIM. You weren't allowed on AIM. <laughs> no, young lady, you have to be 12. You sorry. Wait till you're in junior middle school, then you can get on AIM. What would we, I think Professor Laura is a good name. I think that's a good name. You should, you could use that. She doesn't want to tell me her handle. I know she has a handle. Anybody uh, of a certain age, you know, a young person, they have a handle. My daughter, who's now 28, when she was uh, on AIM, had a ridiculous handle. Got a base, not a life. First of all, a couple of problems with that. Too long. Second of all, she played a base for five minutes, okay? She wasn't, you know. <laughs> but that's what you do when you're young. You, you take on these personas. You think tech guy, is that a handle? Yeah, I guess it is. I could be the tech guy. I wouldn't want to go in a chat room and call myself the tech guy. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's a little too gaudy. Looks like the Apple car might really be real. We've been hearing rumors about this for the longest darn time. Then Hyundai said, oh, yeah, we're talking to Apple. And then they quickly, after Apple called him up and said, uh, do you really want to say that? And Hyundai said, no, 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 that wasn't us. <laughs> <They're t> <laughs> but apparently it's true. Hyundai's Kia Motors, which is their su a subsidiary, is rumored to be Working with Apple, the rumor is a $3.6 billion investment in Kia, a manufacturing partment. This is according to a Korean site. So I don't know. I don't know what their track record is on these rumors. Sound, it's oddly um, specific, though. That always makes me think maybe it's real. They would see Kia building Apple cars. It has a facility in Georgia, so it would be actually in the U.S., which I think is smart if you're Apple. Don't build them in Korea. Build them in Georgia. That's good. We'll be watching. Apparently, this deal could be signed in as little as 10 days. Now, when would we get an Apple car? I have heard numbers ranging from next year to 2030. <laughs> but this rumor is that they would try to get Apple cars out in the 2024 time frame, which is pretty soon. Apple and Kia, according to this rumor, produce plan to produce 100,000 vehicles a year. That's a lot. Took Tesla a while to build up to that, ramp up to that. But uh, hey, Kia's built cars before. And what would these cars be? They'd be electric. They'd be self driving. They'd be Apple y. With, I don't know what that means. If Apple built a car, what would it look like? Would it have no buttons? Would the charging port be on the bottom? I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to, um, we'll have to find out. Hyundai has a uh, battery electric vehicle platform they could use. So they've been doing this for a while. 2024, 2025. Would you buy an Apple car? What would an Apple car look like? Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. In our last installment, we reviewed the events that took place between 1951 and 1953. In that two-year period, the Class A, B, and C licenses had been renamed the Advanced, General, and Conditional Class licenses, respectively. Three new licenses had been created, the Extra, Technician and Novice. 
Also during that period, 40 meters was finally open to phone operation after being a CW only band for years. We lost the top 50 kilocycles of 20 meters, but gained our new 15 meter band. The advanced class was closed to new applicants, although those holding this license could still renew. And in a surprising decision, the FCC opened all phone bands to the general and conditional class operators. Previously, holders of class B and C licenses could only operate HF phone on 10 meters. Now all amateurs conditional to extra class had the same on the air operating privileges. Many amateurs resented the fact that the advanced and extra class operators had no exclusive frequencies and that there was no incentive for a general or conditional class license to upgrade. Some of these complaints filtered their way to the ARRL. And so in the February 1963 issue of QST, an editorial appeared in which the ARRL expressed regret over the abandonment of the incentive license structure, called the 1952 decision a step backward, and proposed a new incentive licensing system be implemented. The idea of exclusive frequencies for advanced and extra class hams at the expense of the generals and conditionals drew volumes of mail in response. Some of the comments printed in QST included, absolutely outrageous, ridiculous, your editorial hits the nail on the head, thought-provoking, congratulations to the ARRL, and to hell with the ARRL. The responses in QST were about evenly split for and against. There were a few letters from generals and conditionals who supported the idea of incentive licensing, even though they would clearly lose under the proposal. On May 3, 1963, the ARRL Board of Directors adopted their official position on incentive licensing. Their proposal would completely take away all general and conditional class phone privileges on 75, 40, 20, and 15 meters in a two-year phase-in period. In other words, the ARRL's incentive licensing would only allow HF phone operation for generals and conditionals on 10 meters and on the small sliver of 160 meters that was available in the days of Loran radio navigation. The ARRL also suggested reopening the advanced class license again to those who held a general or conditional class license for one year. Strangely, the ARRL did not suggest that extras be given exclusive frequencies, nor did they propose exclusive CW frequencies for the extras. Rather, they just wanted exclusive access to the 75 through 15 meter phone segments for the advanced and extra class licenses. Again, the mail poured in pro and con. Many hams felt betrayed for, at this time, the ARRL was running a building fund drive to raise $250,000 to construct the headquarters that now stands at 225 Main Street in Newington, Connecticut. In effect, they believe the ARRL was saying, thanks for your donation, now say goodbye to your HF phone privileges. They were not happy. On April 1st, 1965, the FCC, in response to the ARRL proposal and proposals submitted by others, released their own version of incentive licensing. For generals and conditionals, the FCC proposal was not as bad as the leagues. The FCC would take away about 50% of their phone frequencies on 75 through 15 meters, but they would still have access to half of each phone band. For the advanced class license, formerly Class A, it was a disaster. The FCC, instead of reopening the advanced class, proposed creating a new amateur first class. This license would have a code speed of 16 words per minute. Worse, the FCC would bump the present advanced class operators down to general upon renewal. Now it was the advanced class licensees who were outraged. Prior to 1952, they had held the top license. Now, in effect, they would be demoted two grades and lose 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands. The FCC also proposed exclusive 50 kilocycle CW subbands for extra class licensees on 80 through 15 meters, small exclusive phone segments for extras, and incentive restrictions on 6 and 2 meters. For the next two years, 1965 through 1967, the battle raged on. 
hundreds of proposals and counterproposals were made. The ARRL opposed any incentive subbands on 6 and 2 meters and worked to retain the advanced class in lieu of the proposed amateur first class license. On August 24, 1967, the FCC announced its decision. There would not be a new amateur first class ticket or a 16 word per minute requirement. The advanced class would not be demoted to general, but rather would be reopened as the intermediate step between the general and extra. In summary, the FCC rules established a three-step phase-in of incentive licensing to begin on November 22, 1967. On that day, the advanced class was reopened to new applicants after a 15-year freeze, and novices were given a two-year non-renewable license instead of the previous one-year non-renewable term. On November 22, 1968, novices lost their two-meter voice privileges. Generals, conditionals, and technicians lost the first 100 kilocycles of six meters. The first 25 kilocycles of the 80 through 15 meter CW bands became extra only, and generals and conditionals lost about 25% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands, which were given to the advanced and extra class hams. Comments and opinions still poured into the FCC and the ARRL, requesting anything from total abandonment of incentive licensing to even more restrictive allocations. Most of the comments suggested that the third phase, scheduled for implementation on November 22, 1969, was too severe. Upon review, the Commission agreed in part. Thus, on September 24, 1969, the FCC scaled back the schedule changes. As a result, technicians, conditionals, and generals did not lose the 50.1 through 50.25 megacycle segment of 6 meters, where most of the sideband activity was, and the extra class CW subbands were kept at 25 kilocycles. After November 22, 1969, generals and conditionals had only 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands, advanced had about 90%, and extra class licenses retained 100% of their previous allocations. On a final note, the FCC, in its report and order adopting incentive licensing, had refused to increase the VHF operating privileges for technicians and had taken away novice voice operations on two meters. There was a reason for this. The FCC wanted novices to bypass the technician class license and go right to general. Why? In our next installment, we will journey back to the amateur world in the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s to take a closer look at the technician class license and the unique position it held. I hope you'll be with me. The Mississippi Valley Amateur Radio Association fielded a team to the parking lot of a local television station to take part in the Minnesota QSO party over the February 7th and 8th weekend. Not only did the group get some emergency exercise training, but garnered positive publicity for amateur radio from the station's news team. Here is what it sounded like on WXOW TV News. The Mississippi Valley Amateur Radio Association set up camp in the News 19 parking lot today for what they call the Minnesota QSO Party. They worked to contact as many counties in the state of Minnesota as they could in a certain period of time. Vice President Bill Kleinschmidt says training also helps them practice setting up gear in bad or cold weather. They're able to set up anywhere and they can do it anytime they want. He says it's important in case of any sort of emergency. Just in case of some sort of emergency situation, we have participated in emergency drills with county officials and with state officials in the past. Um, and we just wanna make sure that we are up to speed with everything that we have in, in, in the object of being able to set it up quickly and make it work um, in sort of a situation like that, as well as have fun with our hobby. They're able to talk to anyone in the world with no interference. Typically, they invite people to come see what they do, but because of COVID, they're unable to right now. But if you're interested in getting involved or have another interest in electronics and radio, they encourage people to visit their website. Now with more details, we go to Rick Lindquist at League Headquarters. Using special event call sign W0M, 10 radio amateurs, 
including one newly minted general class ham who's still awaiting his call sign, pitched in. The operation took place in an emergency communications bus with everything set up like a field day operation, although in the Minnesota winter. One of the ops, Scott Nader, KA9FOX, said MVARA recently acquired the full-sized emergency communications bus. It needed some TLC, and the club has been refurbishing it over the past year and was looking for an opportunity to give it a test outing. As a bonus to operating at the TV station, the news department couldn't resist checking out what the hams were doing, and the hams wound up being part of the 10 p.m. news broadcast on Channel 19. The operation was a huge success. The W0M team claimed more than 200,000 points. Operating the Minnesota QSO party looked like a fun way to test things out. Nieder said the sub-zero weather didn't make things easy, especially with respect to setup and teardown process. A club member works at television station WXOW in La Crosse, Wisconsin, which has its tower and studios at a high location in Houston County, Minnesota. That was the end to obtain permission to set up in the station's parking lot. As a bonus to operating at the television station, the news department couldn't resist checking out what we were doing, and we wound up being a part of the 10 p.m. news broadcast, Nieder said. The group set up two operating positions, and given the cold temperatures, they went with dipoles for 80, 40, and 20 meters, up about 20 to 35 feet. The group experienced a few computer and radio issues that needed to be worked out after the contest started. This was expected and, of course, part of the reason for our participation, but it did cause us to be off the air for some brief periods. Judging from the statistics the club posted on 3830.com, the operation was a great success. We had a blast and are looking forward to more operations like this, as well as being able to use the communications bus as a mobile tool to educate students and the general public about amateur radio, and to support our communities with any emergency communications needs as they may arise, Nieder said. As reported, the W0M team claimed 203,392 points with 381 contacts in 57 U.S. states and Canadian provinces and 54 out of 87 Minnesota counties in 10 hours of CW, SSB, and digital operation. The team's Bill Kleinschmidt, N9FDE, said an excursion for the Wisconsin QSO party may be the club's next adventure. An American-built RF jamming system is about to begin production to help the military in Australia. Their military is expected to benefit from the protective power of RF jammers under a system being developed by Northrop Grumman Corporation. The system of open architecture RF jammers will be built by electronic warfare experts to provide protection from radio-controlled improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. The system is designed to minimize disruption to communication systems while establishing a protective barrier for the warfighters and their equipment. The $329 million order for the system, which is designed to protect foot soldiers, vehicles, and permanent structures, according to officials of the U.S. Naval Sea Systems Command, which announced the order. Work will be done in San Diego, California, and is expected to be ready for delivery to Australia by December of 2022. Meanwhile, in the world down under, the popular Wyong Field Day in Australia has been canceled due to pandemic precautions. But in light of recent new COVID events across Australia and the situation's changeable nature at present, the executive committee of the Central Coast Amateur Radio Club with input from a survey of club members, has decided not to run the Wyong Field Day 2021, which was planned for Sunday, the 28th of February. This is a decision that wasn't easy, and it was taken considering the safety of club members, traders, and those who attend that day. However, open your calendars as the club wishes to announce the Central Coast Amateur Radio Club's Mayhem event, which will be held on Sunday, the 30th of May, 2021, at the Wyong Racecourse. We'd like to see this one-time event attract as many visitors as Field Day does every year, and who knows, this could be the largest gathering of radio amateurs in the Southern Hemisphere this year. Traders have already been contacted and informed of the new date. We expect the exhibitor and lecturer varieties to be as broad as was planned for the 2021 Field Day. 
Full details and information regarding this event will be updated on the club's website at ccarc.org.au and through social media as it becomes available. A Canadian satellite operator has become the latest player to join the low-Earth orbit action over Earth's skies. The company Talsat announced on February 9th that it intends to build a constellation of 300 satellites in order to deliver high-speed internet worldwide in the next two years. Known as Lightspeed, it will be designed to serve fixed and mobile network operations, aeronautical and maritime users, enterprise customers, and governments. Consumers wishing to use Lightspeed service would purchase their service from one of Lightspeed's direct customers. The company said financing still needed to be finalized. If Telsat is successful, that would make the company the latest seeking to offer satellite-based internet services. The most well-known one is perhaps SpaceX Starlink service, which is already serving parts of North America. Project Keeper has also announced it is moving forward, but has had no launches yet. This just in from IRTS. The Irish Radio Transmitters Society Awards Committee is seeking nominations for awards for services to the society or to amateur radio, and for awards to IRTS members for other achievements. The winners in these categories would normally be presented with their inscribed trophy or shield in person at the annual general meeting. However, due to COVID-19 restrictions, the trophies and shields will be inscribed but will not be distributed to the winners except where a winner specifically requests delivery. The committee said that it was important that fellow experimenters and operators who work and put in effort on behalf of each amateur and for the society be recognised and rewarded. The committee asks for nominations for special awards to be sent to the awards manager at IRTS. The address can be found under this item on the Southgate Amateur Radio Club news website, southgatearc.org. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Friday, February 12th, 2021. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspots are gone with none seen since February 3rd. Spaceweather.com reported on February 10th that a small proto-sunspot was struggling to form, but it was gone by the next day. According to Spaceweather.com, 57% of the days so far in 2021 have been spotless. This is the same as the percentage of spotless days for all of 2020. Average daily solar flux was 72.8 over the reporting period, with last week's average at 74.2. Average planetary A indices increased from 6.7 to 7.7, and average daily middle latitude A indexes rose from 4.6 to 6. These are still low, quiet numbers, quite favorable for conditions on 80 and 160 meters, especially during the winter. The predicted solar flux for the next 15 days or so is 75 on February 13th to the 19th, 78 on February 20th to the 22nd, 76 on February 23rd to the 25th, 74 on February 26th, 73 on February 27th to March 1st, and 72 on March 2nd to the 7th. Solar flux values may rise to 78 again after the middle of March, just before the spring equinox in the northern hemisphere, which occurs on March 20th. The predicted planetary A indice is 5 on February 13th and 14th, 22 and 14 on February 15th and 16th, 5 on February 17th to the 20th, and looking further ahead, the planetary A index will be 20, 16, and 12 on February 21st to the 23rd, respectively, 5 on February 24th to the 28th, and 18 and 14 on March 1st and 2nd. Time now for the AMSAT report. Even though Rad FX Sat 2 or Fox 1E is hard to hear, it has earned its AMSAT designator as AMSAT Oscar 109 or AO 109. NORAD has confirmed that catalog ID 47311 or Object C is AO109. If you are not currently working satellites, you might want to take a look at working either AO27 or SO50. Both are FM satellites and easy to work with an HT and a handheld dual band 2 meter 70 centimeter antenna. 
Many programs are out there to download that will let you know when a satellite is overhead and just where to point your antenna. If you program your handheld with a few frequencies to adjust the 70 centimeter frequency for Doppler, you just have to give a quick twist of the knob. Many operators are using one dual band HT or two single band HTs. These, along with one of the handheld antennas, make a great satellite station that you can use from anywhere. The AMSAT report comes to us each week via Bruce Page, KK5DO. A new study in the research journal Space Weather considers what might happen if a worst-case coronal mass ejection hit Earth. A perfect solar storm, if you will. In 2014, Bruce Suratani of Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Gerbax Lakina of the Indian Institute of Geomagnetism introduced the perfect coronal mass ejection. It could create a magnetic storm with intensity up to the saturation limit, a value greater than the Carrington event of 1859, the researchers said. Many other space weather effects would not be limited by saturation effects, however. The interplanetary shock would arrive at Earth within about 12 hours. The shock impingement onto the magnetosphere would create a sudden impulse of around 234 nanoteslas, and the magnetic pulse duration in the magnetosphere would be about 22 seconds. Orbiting satellites would be exposed to extreme levels of flare and interplanetary coronal mass ejection shock accelerated particle radiation, they said. The event would follow an initial CME that would clear the path in front of it, allowing the storm cloud to hit Earth with maximum force. The Solar and Heliospheric Observatory has observed CMEs leaving the Sun at speeds of up to 3,000 km per second, and many instances of one CME clearing the way for another have been recorded. The CME's 12-hour travel time would allow little margin for preparation. The CME would hit Earth's magnetosphere at 45 times the local speed of sound, and the resulting geomagnetic storm could be as much as twice as strong as the Carrington event. Power grids, GPS, and other services could experience significant outages. More recent research, led by physicist Dan Welling of the University of Texas at Arlington, took a fresh look at Suratani and Lakina's perfect CME, and given improvements in space weather modeling, he was able to reach new conclusions. Welling's team found that geomagnetic disturbances in response to a perfect CME could be 10 times stronger than Suratani and Lakina had calculated, especially at latitudes above 45 to 50 degrees. Our results exceed values observed during many past extreme events, including the March 1989 storm that brought down the Hydro-Quebec power grid in eastern Canada, the May 1921 railroad storm, and the Carrington event itself Welling summarized. A key result of the new study is how the CME would distort and compress Earth's magnetosphere. The strike would push the magnetopause down until it's only two Earth radii above Earth's surface. Satellites in Earth orbit would suddenly find themselves exposed to a hail of energetic and potentially damaging charged particles. Other research has indicated that phenomena such as the Carrington event may not be as rare as once thought. A much weaker magnetic storm brought down the Canadian Hydro-Quebec system in 1989. Scientists believe a perfect CME will happen someday. As Welling et al. conclude, further exploring and preparing for such extreme activity is important to mitigate space weather related catastrophes. In July 2012, NASA and European spacecraft watched an extreme solar storm erupt from the Sun and narrowly miss Earth. If it had hit, we would still be picking up the pieces, said Daniel Baker of the University of Colorado at a NOAA space weather workshop two years later. It might have been stronger than the Carrington event itself. With this year's HamSci workshop coming up on March 19th and 20th, 
The deadline is approaching fast for hams, scientists, and other experts to submit presentation abstract proposals. This year's theme is mid-latitude ionospheric sensing, but presentations are not required on that subject. The workshop will again be held virtually on Zoom, as it was last year, in cooperation with the University of Scranton in Pennsylvania and sponsored by the National Science Foundation. A team meeting will also be held for Hamside's Personal Space Weather Station project. This project's goal is the creation of a citizen science instrument that enables space weather to be studied right from your QTH. Abstracts for presentations are due by the 15th of February. They can be sent via the conference webpage or hamside.org. Meanwhile, members of the Military Auxiliary Radio System will have their first interoperability exercise with the amateur radio community on February 23rd through the 27th. Exercises will begin on Channel 1, the initial calling channel on 60 meters, but may not necessarily be limited to that channel. U.S. Army Morris Chief Paul English, WD8DBY, issued a statement saying that ICS-213 messages will be passed in both voice and digital modes. Radio operations will also take place in the usual voice modes. Following this month's exercise, the next one will be held from March 1st to March 7th. Well, each year there are significant activities to celebrate World Radio Day. It's rather special this year. It's the 10th anniversary of the event, and radio amateurs as well as broadcasters are all joining in. Amateur radio special event stations will be on the air to celebrate World Radio Day on February the 13th, which this year has the theme Evolution, Innovation and Connection. Spain's EA Digital Federation reports that a number of special event radio call signs will be active from February the 12th to the 14th. They all have the suffix WRD, World Radio Day, and they're in the range Alpha Oscar 1 to Alpha Oscar 9. Listen out for them on the air. On the occasion of World Radio Day 2021, UNESCO calls on radio stations to celebrate this event's 10th anniversary and more than 110 years of radio. This year's WRD is divided into three main sub-themes. Evolution, the world changes, radio evolves. This sub-theme refers to the resilience of radio and to its sustainability. Innovation, the world changes, radio adapts and innovates. Radio has had to adapt to new technologies to remain the go-to medium of mobility, accessible everywhere and to everyone. And connection. The world changes, radio connects. This sub-theme highlights radio services to our society, natural disasters, socio-economic crises, epidemics and so on. And to mark World Radio Day, the BBC World Service has some special programmes to be broadcast over the weekend. BBC Minute, the programme on the BBC World Service, is linked up with its partner radio stations in English and Spanish. DJs on English and Spanish-speaking stations around the world are going to be sharing their experiences and messages about their year of the pandemic. These will be brought together and shared across the day on Friday the 12th and Saturday the 13th of February within BBC Minute's news bulletins. In addition, BBC World Service will air a one-hour documentary on Sunday the 14th of February called World Wide Waves – The Sound of Community Radio. In this documentary, they will visit community stations around the globe that educate, entertain and empower people to make change, including Radio Taboo in Cameroon, Kodal Osai that translates as The Sound of the Ocean in Tamil Nadu, and Radio Nacional de Juanini in Bolivia. This documentary highlights the enduring power, possibilities and pleasures of the airwaves. BBC News Arabic Radio, one of the World Service's oldest non-English radio stations, will also be delivering special content to mark the day. This will include them asking listeners to record a one-minute clip explaining why radio still matters to them, with some selected for broadcast. You can read more about the BBC World Service coverage at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash media centre. And to find out more about UNESCO and the World Radio Day, go to en.unesco.org forward slash commemorations forward slash World Radio Day. Foundations of Amateur Radio Over the past little while I've been experimenting with various tools that decode radio signals. For some of those tools, the signals come from space. Equipment in space is moving all the time, which means that the thing you want to hear isn't always in range. 
For example, the International Space Station, or ISS, has a typical orbit of 90 minutes. Several times a day there's a pass. That means that it's somewhere within receiving range of my station. It might be very close to the horizon and only visible for a few seconds, or it might be directly overhead and visible for 10 minutes. If it's transmitting APRS on a particular frequency, it can be decoded using something like Multimon NG. If it's transmitting slow scan TV, QSSTV can do the decoding. I've done this, and I must say it's exciting to see a picture come in line by line. Highly recommended. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has a fleet of satellites in a polar orbit that lasts about 102 minutes, and they're overhead at least every 12 hours. You can use something like NOAA apps to decode the images coming from the various weather satellites, or a Python script, and I'll talk about that at some point. There's a growing cloud of cube satellites with interesting telemetry. They're in all kinds of orbits, and you can attempt to receive data from each one as it's in sight. Keeping track of what's where and when is a full-time job for plenty of people. As a radio amateur, I'm happy to defer to the experts who tell me where a piece of equipment is, and when I'm likely to be able to receive a radio signal from the transmitter I'm interested in. Previously, I've mentioned in passing a tool called G-Predict that does this heavy lifting for me. It presents a map of the world and shows what's visible at my location and when the next acquisition of signal for a particular satellite might occur. It talks to the internet to download the latest orbital information. It also has the ability to control a rotator to point your antenna, not that I have one, and it can update the transmit and receive frequency of your radio to compensate for the Doppler effect that changes the observed frequency as a satellite passes overhead. All this works with a graphical user interface, that is to say, you have a screen that you're looking at and can click on. Whilst running G-Predict, you can simultaneously launch the appropriate decoding tool for the signal that you're trying to receive. If you have a powerful enough computer, you can run multiple decoding tools together. You'll have separate windows for controlling the radio and antenna, for decoding APRS, SSTV, NOAA, and if you're wanting to do sunrise and sunset propagation testing using Whisper, you can also run WSJTX or any other decoder you're interested in. There are some implications associated with doing this, apart from needing a big enough screen, needing considerable computing power, and burning electricity for no good reason, the signal that comes in from your radio will be fed to all the decoders at the same time, and all of them will attempt to decode the signal, even when you know that this serves no purpose. That's fine if you don't know what you're listening to, but most of the time you know exactly what it is, even if the software doesn't. Manually launching and quitting decoders is one option, but what if the next ISS pass is at 3am? Aside from the computing requirements, so far this works fine with a standard analog radio like my Yaesu FT-857D. The only limitation is that you can only receive one station at a time. If you replace the analog radio with an RTL-SDR dongle, you gain the ability to record and decode simultaneous stations within about 2.4 MHz of each other. Another option is to use an ADALM Pluto, and as long as the stations are within 20 MHz of each other, you can record and decode their signals. If you're not familiar with a Pluto, it's essentially a computer, receiver and transmitter all in a little box, the size of a pack of cards. This is where it gets interesting. The Pluto doesn't have a screen, or a keyboard for that matter, but it's a computer. It runs Linux, and you can run decoders on it. I've done this with ADS-B signals using a tool called Dump1090. You'll find it on my GitHub page. One of the sticking points in decoding signals from space was the ability to predict when a satellite pass occurs without requiring a computer screen. Thanks to a command line tool called PREDICT, written by John, Kilo Bravo 2, Bravo Delta and others, I've now discovered a way to achieve that. My efforts are not quite at the point of show and tell, but I've got a Docker container that's building and running PREDICT on its own, and using a little bash script it's telling me when the ISS is overhead. You'll find that on GitHub as well. My next challenge is to do some automated decoding of actual space signals. 
I'm going to start with the ISS, Predict and Multimon NG. I'll let you know how I go. What space signals are you interested in? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. And now, to conclude his six-part series on how to write a public service announcement to successfully promote your club's activities on local broadcast stations, here is Indiana's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In this sixth segment on the topic of promoting your not-for-profit ham radio club's events, we'll look into some hints and suggestions for getting your public service announcement on the air for free. In the broadcast industry, a common business practice is what they call trade. Radio stations trade ads for services. They trade airtime for products and services. Some stations trade advertising airtime for perks like free meals for station employees at local restaurants, free gas at gas stations for ads, office equipment and computers for ads, and more. You can use this to your advantage too. When you are able to create the ultimate PSA script, the next thing to accomplish is to get it recorded professionally, and here's where the trade comes in. First off, it is not advisable to get a present or recently passed local DJ or announcer to record your PSA, since other radio stations are not likely to broadcast a competitor's voice. Unless you have a club member with professional sound gear at home who can produce it, record it, and produce CDs or reel-to-reel -reel tapes for your club, your next best bet is to research trade. Many radio stations buy or trade for professional voice services. They email or fax scripts and get tapes or CDs in the mail a week or so later. You may be able to get your local station to have this done along with theirs at no cost since they typically pay a monthly fee which does not change with usage. Some stations have local folks they hire and pay like 20 bucks to come in and voice some commercials once a month or so. These folks may be willing to do yours too at no extra cost. All this will, will require some sort of relationship with a local radio station which can start with something as simple as inviting them to your next club meeting, personally tutoring them or a family member through your technician test classes and VE session, or a few free tickets to your next ham fest. You could also offer to trade ham fest table space for a professionally recorded PSA for your next ham fest. Anyway, trade is something common in the broadcast industry, so use it to help promote your club. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. A scientific paper has linked Jupiter with solar cycles. The paper, published in Solar Physics, predicts that the solar cycle 25 maximum will take place in 2026 and reach an amplitude similar to that of solar cycle 24. The article dealt with the prediction of the upcoming solar activity cycle, Solar Cycle 25, the scientists proposing that, okay, some scientific jargon here coming up, astronomical ephemeris specifically taken from the catalogs of aphelia of the four Jovian planets could be drivers of variations in solar activity represented by the series of sunspots from 1749 to 2020. The researchers concluded with a prediction of Solar Cycle 25 that can be compared to a dozen predictions by other authors, with the solar max occurring in 2026, plus or minus a year, and reach an amplitude of 97.6, plus or minus 7.8, similar to that of Solar Cycle 24. The RAD FXSAT 2 FOX 1E CubeSat has been designated as AMSAT Oscar 109 as troubleshooting continues. The satellite, which carries a telemetry beacon and a linear transponder, along with radiation effects experiments, is a joint mission of AMSAT and the Institute for Space and Defense Electronics at Vanderbilt University. While the telemetry beacon on 435.750 MHz has not yet been heard, the transponder is partially operational at reduced signal strength. 
Work continues to recover the telemetry beacon and characterize the transponder with the goal of opening it for general use, AMSAT said this week. Testing and characterization of RAD FXSAT 2 AO109 continues. On January 27th, a ham in Nevada reported weekly hearing his CW signal via the spacecraft's transponder. AMSAT Engineering and Operations was able to confirm the reports from Brad Schumacher, W5SAT, and determined that RAD FXSAT 2 is partially functioning, although signals are extremely weak. AMSAT Engineering and Operations teams made the official AO109 designation after confirmation that the linear transponder is functional, although with a low-level downlink signal. AMSAT was not positive which of the several suspect objects, D, C, and M, was actually RAD FXSAT 2, FOX 1E, with AMSAT's Drew Glassbrenner, KO4MA, targeting object C as the most likely. Recently, the satellites have been sufficiently spread apart to allow testing to determine which object is RAD FXSAT 2, FOX 1E, AMSAT said. During passes on February 2nd, Command Station Mark Hammond, N8MH, compared objects D, C, and M for the best fit for received signals with Doppler correction on both uplink and downlink frequencies. Object D and M were quickly eliminated from further consideration due to poor frequency predictions of Doppler correction compared to observed signals. The clear best fit is Object C, which is known as Object C Interdes 2021-02C and NORAD CAT ID 47311, AMSAT said. Therefore, AMSAT is happy to identify Object C stroke 2021-002C stroke 47311U as RAD FXSAT 2 FOX 1E and make the designation AO109. Thanks to Alan Biddle, WA4SCA, for support during the identification. AMSAT said its engineering and operations teams appreciate the satellite community's cooperation to date and reiterated its request that users not attempt to use the transponder until further notice. The proper identification will allow further characterization of the satellite's condition through additional testing, AMSAT concluded. RAD FXSAT-2 FOX-1E was launched on January 17th on Virgin Orbit Launcher 1, which carried 10 other satellites into space. RAD FXSAT-2 FOX-1E carries an inverting linear transponder with uplink at 145.860 MHz and 145890 MHz and downlink at 435.760 MHz and 435.790 MHz. Telemetry will downlink on 435.750 MHz. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copy sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. The RSGB construction competitions have proved really popular, and it's good to see many radio hams still getting much enjoyment from producing things at home to enhance their hobby, and the standard is incredibly high.
We've just got the results of the most recent Get On The Air To Care construction competition. The Radio Society of Great Britain's Get On The Air To Care construction competition was for projects made during the autumn 2020 lockdown, the Christmas and New Year holiday period, or the early 2021 lockdown. The Society was delighted to receive 27 entries from 15 entrants, and the standard was very high. And to reflect this, the judges awarded four prizes rather than choose just one winner as originally planned. The RSGB would like to thank everyone who entered, and they congratulate each of the four winners. Gordon Lean, Golf 3 Whiskey Juliet Golf, received the first prize of £125 for his project, a 25-watt HF SDR transceiver made using GNU radio and modules bought on eBay. The runner-up was Paul Graham, Mike Zero Papa Golf X-Ray, with a prize of £75 for his satellite antenna rotator that is easy to reproduce so long as you can solder and have a 3D printer. Lawrence Fletcher, Golf 4 Sierra X-Ray Hotel, won the third prize of £50 for his version of the Langstone SDR transceiver based on the design by Colin Durbridge, Golf 4 Echo Mike Lima. Colin's clever design is based on a Raspberry Pi 4 computer. Robert Lynch, Mike Zero, November Victor, Quebec, was highly commended and receives the RSGB handbook for building the Mike Zero Uniform Kilo Delta N-Fed Half-Wave Antenna Coupler. You can find out more about these projects in the April Radcom and on the RSGB website. The article Ham Radio Forms a Planet-Sized Space Weather Sensor Network appeared February 9th in EOS the Earth and Space Science News, an American Geophysical Union publication. It sprang from a project by the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, Ham SCI, founded by Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, at the University of Scranton, one of the paper's authors. The others are David Kazdan, AD8Y, and Christina Collins, both of Case Western Reserve University, W8EDU. The article says that with their experience dealing with ionospheric influenced propagation, amateur radio operators have an empirical knowledge of space, weather, and offer a ready-made volunteer science community. The article covers the method and research being used to monitor the effects of solar activity on Earth's atmosphere, telecommunications, and electrical utilities, and the valuable data being crowdsourced from amateur radio signal. To fully understand the variability of small spatial scales and short time scales, the scientific community will require vastly larger and denser sensing networks to collect data on continental and global scales, the article asserts. And with open source instrumentation cheaper and more plentiful than ever before, the time is ripe for amateur scientists to take the distributed measurements of the ionosphere, and the amateur radio community is up to the challenge. The reach of these crowdsourced systems and the support of the amateur community offers tremendous opportunities for scientific measurements, the article notes. The research acknowledges that a handful of AM SCI collaborators from organizations and universities and is supported by the National Science Foundation grants. AM SCI's personal space weather stations, the initiatives aim to develop a network of specially equipped amateur stations that will allow amateurs to collect useful data for space science research. As the article explains, ham radio operators and researchers through Ham SCI are designing hardware for a distributed network of personal space weather stations. November and December 2021 marked the 100th anniversary of a successful ARRL transatlantic test, which took advantage of the data gathered via university and individual stations, an early example of citizen scientists leveraging amateur radio. The 2021 AM SCI Virtual Workshop will take place March 19th and 20th. Here's the listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars, a members-only benefit. To register or to check on upcoming webinars and view previously recorded sessions, visit the ARRL website. Maxim Memorial Station W1AW Tour, hosted by Joe Garcia, NJ1Q, W1AW Station Manager. Maxim Memorial Station W1AW, located in Newington, Connecticut, was established to honor the memory of ARRL's co-founder and first president, Hiram Percy Maxim. Although the first radio station of ARRL was actually located in Hartford, Connecticut, and active as W1MK, W1AW in Newington is known worldwide and considered the radio station most associated with Hiram Percy Maxim. 
Formally established in 1938, nearly two years after the death of Hiram Percy Maxim, W1AW has consistently been on the air, save for the time when the station was ordered off the air by the FCC because of World War II. This webinar is scheduled for Thursday, February 18th, 2021 at 3.30 p.m. Eastern or 2030 UTC. Talking to Astronauts, an elementary school's exciting Aries experience, hosted by Diane Warner, KE8 HLD. This is a story about Talmage Elementary School's participation in a once-in-a-lifetime Aris school contact. Learn about their amazing journey leading up to the amateur radio contact with an astronaut on the International Space Station. The excitement of the entire experience was shared not just by the students, but included faculty, parents, the community, and local amateur radio operators. You will also learn how to begin the process of submitting your own Aries contact proposal. This webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. Visit the ARRL Learning Network to register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions. Regrouping to accommodate the pandemic, a respected emergency communications event has been able to extend its reach far beyond the Pacific Northwest. For the first time in its 20 years, Communications Academy is going global. The pandemic has turned the two-day emergency preparedness conference in the Pacific Northwest into a live online event with possibilities for international participation. It's being held this year on April 10th and 11th. Although it attracts a sizable number of hams, attendees needn't be an amateur radio operator. In fact, many of the presenters are hams, including Tom Cox, VE6TOX of ICS Consultants for Emergency Alberta Management Agency, Jason Bierman, KI7KVP, the director of Snohomish, Washington's Department of Emergency Management, and Ward Silver, N0AX, who will present on station grounding and bonding. If you're anywhere in the world and want to sharpen your emergency communication skills, this is a free opportunity to receive training while getting real time access to presenters. Although the presentations will be recorded, experts will be available for a live chat with attendees in QA sessions. Tim Helming, WT1IM, said that Com Academy is the only surviving significant event in Washington State, and it was made possible by switching it to a virtual event. He said it promises to be a great training opportunity for all of us in Washington State and perhaps beyond. Tim said graduates of the two-day academy will often go on and do good work putting their knowledge into action, which of course is what it's all about. For details or to register, visit comacademy.org. Do you remember the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI? The idea was to seek out narrow-band radio transmissions that would betray the existence of technically competent beings elsewhere in the galaxy. What was revolutionary about the project was that, in order to have a hope of processing the vast amounts of data coming at us from space, as many people as possible were asked to process a chunk of data, a sort of early crowdsourcing. Well now, a similar initiative is launching, which calls on the huge number of radio amateurs around the globe to get involved in work to understand the incredibly complex performance of the ionosphere. You might want to think about getting involved. Here's the story. On the EOS website, there's an interesting article about how radio amateurs are helping to advance space science. Considerable interest exists in developing space weather forecasting technologies that use Earth's ionosphere as a sensor for events in its neighboring atmospheric layers. The ionosphere occupies a privileged niche in the geospace system, as it's coupled into both the terrestrial weather of the neutral atmosphere below and the space weather of the magnetosphere above. Although we have a good understanding of ionospheric climate, diurnal and seasonal variations are well known, as are the rhythms of the sunspot cycle. There are new and vital areas of research still to be explored. For example, it's known that the ionosphere and near-Earth space experiences what is termed variability. In other words, radio signals can fade in and out over periods of seconds, minutes or hours due to changes in ionospheric electron densities along signal propagation paths. But this variability has not been sampled or studied adequately on regional and global scales. To fully understand variability on small spatial scales and short time scales, the scientific community will require vastly larger and denser sensing networks that collect data on continental and global scales. 
With open source instrumentation cheaper and more plentiful than ever before, the time is ripe for amateur scientists to take distributed measurements of the ionosphere, and the amateur radio community is up for the challenge. The HAM Radio Science Citizen Investigation, known as HAM SCI, is a collective that unites amateur radio operators with the research community in the space and atmospheric sciences. This confederation of scientists, engineers and hobbyists holds annual workshops during which HAM radio operators and space scientists share their findings. And now a new HAM SCI effort, the Personal Space Weather Station Project, aims to develop a robust and scalable network of amateur radio stations which will allow amateurs to collect useful data for space science researchers. The next HAM SCI workshop will be held virtually over the 19th to the 21st of March 2021 and it will focus on mid-latitude ionospheric measurements. You can read much more about this at eos.org, that's just echooscasierra.org. Navigate to the Features section. And the HAM Radio Science Citizen Investigation website is at hamsci.org. Austria's main amateur radio society is fighting back against proposed laws it considers unfriendly to hams. The Austrian Amateur Radio Society is challenging proposed regulation changes by Parliament that the amateurs say would diminish privileges and spectrum allocations. Society President Mike Zwing, OE3MZC, said that a pending amendment to the Telecommunications Act of 2020 contains language that would erode previous gains made by radio amateurs and fail to protect their licenses. Mike said that the new law's language institutes measures which would impede HAM's roles in emergency communications and passing welfare traffic. The change also raises costs for licenses and imposes larger fines for violations. The amendment also would leave amateurs with no protection against harmful interference. With lifetime licenses abolished, all new licenses being issued would expire after 10 years. The Radio Society would also lose the ability to administer license exams. Mike went on to say that hams enjoy robust activity following the passage of the 2003 and 2007 amateur radio laws favoring experimentation and new technologies. He said a change in government in 2018 led to a new more complex telecoms law that took over the administration of amateur radio laws as well. The Austrian ham organization is encouraging amateurs to contact the Ministry and Telecommunications Authority indicating their support for the group's position. Mike said the society had filed its comments earlier with the Austrian Parliament. News now of some very interesting and pioneering work over in the United States, where the Army are working to increase their ability to intercept communications. It's fascinating stuff, but just remember, Big Brother is watching. Interesting news from the United States Army Research Laboratory. A new quantum sensor can analyze the full spectrum of radio frequency and real-world signals, unleashing new potentials for military communications, spectrum awareness, and electronic warfare. Army researchers built the quantum sensor, which can sample the radio frequency spectrum from 0 Hz up to 20 GHz, and detect AM and FM radio, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and other communication signals. This so-called Rydberg sensor uses laser beams to create highly excited Rydberg atoms directly above a microwave circuit to boost and hone in on the portion of the spectrum being measured. The Rydberg atoms are sensitive to the circuit's voltage, enabling the device to be used as a sensitive probe for the wide range of signals in the RF spectrum. Dr. Kevin Cox, a researcher at the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command, said that all previous demonstrations of Rydberg atomic sensors had only been able to sense small and specific regions of the RF spectrum, but for the first time, the new sensor operates continuously over a wide frequency range. Cox added that this was a really important step towards proving that quantum sensors can provide a new and dominant set of capabilities for soldiers who are operating in an increasingly complex electromagnetic battle space. Researchers excite rubidium atoms to high-energy Rydberg states. 
The atoms interact strongly with the circuit's electric fields, allowing detection and demodulation of any signal received into the circuit. The Rydberg Spectrum Analyzer has the potential to surpass fundamental limitations of traditional electronics in sensitivity, bandwidth and frequency range. Because of this, this spectrum analyzer and other quantum sensors have the potential to unlock a new frontier of ARMY sensors for spectrum awareness, electronic warfare, sensing and communications, and this is part of the US Army's modernization strategy. Army researcher Dr. David Meyer said that devices that are based on quantum constituents are one of the Army's top priorities to enable technical surprise in the competitive future battle space. Quantum sensors in general offer unparalleled sensitivity and accuracy to detect a wide range of mission-critical signals. The researchers plan additional development to improve the signal sensitivity of the Rydberg Spectrum Analyzer, aiming to outperform existing state-of-the-art technology. Dr. Kevin Cox cautioned that significant physics and engineering effort is still necessary before the Rydberg Analyzer can integrate into a field-testable device. One of the first steps will be understanding how to retain and improve the device's performance as the sensor size is decreased. Dr. Cox said that the US Army has emerged as a leading developer of such sensors, and we should expect more cutting-edge research to result as this futuristic technology concept quickly becomes a reality. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater K2RHI on 146.940 MHz, serving the Tri-Cities of New York State's capital region from Mount Refinesque in Brunswick, New York. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.